I'm Nancy Cass, um, welcoming everyone to the Berman Institute of Bioethics every other week seminar. We are thrilled again to have such a great crowd, although I think it's even larger than usual, thanks to you, John. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today, John Wilbeck. So if you'll bear with me, I'm going to look a little bit at my notes to make sure that I say everything I want to say. So um, John is currently the Chief Commons Officer at Sage BioNetworks, where he heads the governance group, and I think we're going to hear more about that. Um, they are interested at SAGE in real-world implications of reuse of big data, often in the cloud and often through what is called open science. Um, before working at SAGE, John had, um, did some interesting previous professional things. He was a legislative aide to Congressman Pete Stark. He served as the first assistant director of Harvard's Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And he founded a company um, called Incelico. Um, which was acquired and um, is a bioinformatics uh, company. In February 2013, in response to a We the People petition that John uh, spearheaded and was signed by 65,000 people, the U.S. government changed its policy and announced a plan to open up taxpayer-funded research data and make it available for free. Um, I will also give my own recommendation that John gave an amazing TED Talk in 2012 that I have referred many, many, many people to um, called Let's Pool Our Medical Data. It's 16 minutes and I really recommend it. Um, I have known John for a while, but I got to know him better in the last year when he was we were serving together on um, the central IRB for the Precision Medicine Initiative. John then had to resign from that task because he became um, a recipient of government money uh, for precision medicine, which is good for all of us as taxpayers, not as good for me on the IRB, but better for us as a country. Um, and he's overseeing the governance and consent procedures for precision medicine. Um, John holds a BA in philosophy from Tulane University, where he also studied French and spent a year at the Sorbonne. So John, we're really pleased to have you here at Hopkins again, and looking forward to your talk. Thank you. So um, I'm going to talk. Uh, I'm going to sort of start by talking about the cultural environment for informed consent right now, because I think it's actually really important and relevant. Uh, I'm going to then dive into some of the work we've done at Sage around informed consent, and then try to tie that to concepts of data sharing and research. Um, and then at the end, I'll give you a few of the examples of where we think our work is going, uh, so that we can end on something a little less dry than, than the point where we're starting with. Um, so you raise your hand if you had this sentence uh, for 2016, right? Like, I wouldn't have known any of these words 18 to 24 months ago, right? Niantic, Pokemon Go. But I certainly wouldn't have thought the Senate would be involved in analyzing video game privacy. But this is actually a really good way for me to jump off and think about what is, what's the cultural context in which informed consent is landing right now. And the growing understanding by legislators and policymakers, as well as individuals, that these devices that we carry around in our pockets are basically creating doppelgangers of us in the data world, and we don't really know how or when or why that data is getting used. Um, I saw this, it's a very gendered uh, advertisement that I saw for Spotify. Uh, it was to insult the man of the house that his wife might know that he was listening to girly music on, on the playlist. But the point remains that the advertising vector was that your car is surveilling you and could tell on you for liking what is might be perceived as female pop music. Um, again, this is a really weird sentence. My car knows I listen to my wife's playlist. But this is the cultural context for data that, that we have to deal with if we're going to enroll people in research studies. Right? At every step, we're offered opportunities to use non-analog mechanisms to pay for things, to get discounts for things, to communicate and connect to people. And they're governed in very obscure ways. And so uh, I'm not a bioethicist, but because my work touches on bioethics, these are often the questions that we have to start with, which is, in this context, what's benefit and what's harm? I use my Safeway card to get my discount, but the reality is that Safeway has priced those items above market only people who use the loyalty program 
get the market price. So there's now a tax on personal privacy at the grocery store. And what are the benefits I get for trading my privacy? What are the harms? And the most important question is often, how do we know whether something is a benefit or a harm? Because the entire system is so opaque and non-transparent that it's really hard to know. So if you go to aboutthedata.com, you can begin to get a sense of yourself through the lens of consumer marketing. This is offered by a company called Axiom. Uh, and this is the company that grew up next to Walmart in Arkansas. It's the, probably the most savvy data purveyor in the United States. And this is me. I've blocked out my date of birth, but that's mainly because I don't like being as old as I am. Um, and this is what it predicts about me based on the data that's been gone from my Facebook, my credit cards, and my loyalty cards and programs. So it's figured out that I'm a guy, that I'm probabilistically uh, white, it thinks I completed graduate school, which is sweet, because I didn't. Um, <laughs> and, and interestingly, it, it often, the data often assumes I'm single. Uh, I'm not single, I'm married, I have a five-year-old kid. Um, but the data haven't caught up to the fact, or, or my algorithmic profile continues to suggest that I'm single. Um, out of all of these, the fact that it thinks I'm a PC owner is the funniest mistake. Um, and it understands what my aspirations are. It knows that I like to cook. Uh, it knows that, that I buy home furnishing things, that I'm into reading, that I wish I could camp and hike more than I did. Um, and these are all very popular aspirational things from a marketing perspective. There's a reason why these categories were chosen to be applied, which is the people who think they're cooks buy cooking stuff they never use, which is really good from the economic perspective. People who think that they are campers and never camp will aspirationally buy tents. <laughs> But the selection of the categories itself is very opaque and very impactful because it dictates the kinds of categories into which I will be lumped. And it even goes all the way, this is all again still about me. You see my average uh, dollar spent per purchase, my total online dollar spent, all of this is aggregated and it's constantly sold. Uh, and the reason it's sold is to offer me advertisements on the websites that I go to. So, all of this is why certain ads follow us around the internet. Because every time we load a web page, there's what's called a programmatic advertising auction that's happening where advertisers are buying space on the browsers of people who fit into the niches that they're looking for. So there's this split second process that's happening while the pages delay and loading to put the right ad in front of me at the right time. And even the phrasing on this, right, they're calling it my DNA as a consumer is interesting and has impacts as we think about bioethics. Um, the reason I bring this up is that I think that a lot of the ethics of this are toxic. Um, there's no informedness, there's no transparency, I have no idea who's buying or selling my data for what purpose, I have no idea where any of this is going, I have no agency. And this all happens under a simple one-click contract that's, that I just click OK on without reading. Um, and in many ways, the reason I got into this space several years ago was I didn't really want to bring that in. Right? That, that struck me as an invasive species from technology that could be really nasty if we brought it into health. Because at least in health, we do have a tradition of ethics and informedness. And you know, uh, Facebook is, is a good example of this. I, I, you know, I'm, I'm not an anti-Facebook person. I've used Facebook many times. But I love this, right? Facebook should choose to show, show us uh, things based on unethical psychological research. They should only make those decisions based on um, however they were doing it before, which was probably ethical, right? <laughs> so everything we see is the result of relentless A-B testing that an IRB would flip out of. And I have friends who work at you know, Google and Facebook. My wife works at Facebook on the policy team. Um, if Google, when they want to test a feature, they test it on like Nevada versus Utah. Right? I had someone tell me as I was researching my TED talk years ago that they would never change something as important as an advertising placement with a sample size as small as a phase two or lower clinical study. If that's too important of an economic decision to make with a sample size that small. Yet we accept this and we make billion dollar choices based on really bad small studies. And so my entire take was, what happens if we import the commons from tech to health? Uh, so this is a friend of mine in Germany, Bastian, uh, who runs the Open SNP project. This is a sort of a donate your genome to science project using a wiki. Um, it's got several thousand genotypes on it. This is mine. I've, I've chosen the default uh, 
uh, Mendel uh, avatar. And I've not done much but besides upload this there. But um, this is an interesting question. So if we wanted to bring the concept of the commons, of open source, from tech to health, what would that look like? And open source and the commons have sort of two frames, depending on where you come from. Uh, one frame is very methodological. It's a productivity benefit and a change to have people who don't work together, who work together. Um, the other is political, which is about freedom. That it can give us a way of, of building things that have a different political culture. And most of the time, these two blend in ways that are not always obvious. But I always try to keep this distinction in mind. So when I'm talking, I may try to point out places where I'm doing something that's methodological versus something that's political. Because I think they both have a role. Um, I work at a nonprofit org called Sage Bio Networks. We're based in Seattle. Um, we're hiring. If anyone's looking for a job, we've got eight jobs open at the moment. Um, I live in DC. I'm the only non-resident staffer, and I lead the governance group. Um, but the way that we try to think about what we do is we're trying to help drag the scientific method into the 21st century. And we think that rests on three pillars. Uh, we don't think it changes the method fundamentally, but we think it creates loops and turns it from a, simple, a circular method into more of a directed graph. Um, so one of those is team science. This is like a productivity benefit, which is that groups of scientists need to exist in units larger than the individual laboratory. There will be problems that are too big for any one group to solve. Open science, which we think of as the creation of assets that can be used as building blocks for other scientists without lots of negotiation and permission. And then participant-centered science. If we're going to hit the sample size of Google or Facebook in a clinical study, we can't just treat people as someone who shows up and we see them once a year and we don't give them anything back. You have to build a relationship with these people if they're going to be willing to endure the A-B testing. The way that we do this is that we run pilot projects. We do not start with a theory and then try to implement. We look for pilots that test out elements of team open participant centricity, run those pilots. Most of them fail, uh, but we almost always learn something valuable about that, which we can then feed back into technology infrastructure, policy infrastructure, and science infrastructure. And we don't think we're successful in support independent research communities that live on top of this and, and, and act in a certain way. The vast majority of what we do at SAGE has lived on a piece of infrastructure called Synapse. This is a uh, sort of a GitHub or a version control platform for data analysis. Think of the way Google Docs lets you track changes across versions, time, and people. Um, we have found this is incredibly useful to use in a data analysis context. Um, because when you have 20 labs that have been funded by the NIH to work in a network, Usually that's like asking a bunch of jazz bands that disagree about jazz to come together and be a wind orchestra without a conductor. And it works about as well as that would. And so Synapse is an environment where we can take those labs and teach them how to work together, which frequently starts with finding the incentive for one lab to share one data set with another lab. And 90% of the work required to share with the world goes into sharing with that other lab. And by getting them into this technical framework, we can take them out of a lot of the stresses on that. So we've got an enormous amount of stuff on this. I would encourage you to go check it out. It's not the focus of my talk. But I, I wanted to sort of start, because this is where we got our start. We got our start helping people work together that didn't work together. And this is becoming a more and more important part of how we fund research as taxpayers. Because the idea is if you can't get that data, that asset reused, if only you could get value out of it, how valuable was the work you did in the first place? How replicable is it? How extensible is it? We realized, though, that we were only really helping people that were getting funded through that kind of project. We weren't helping bring in novel kinds of players. So after we started Synapse, we started a project called Dream, or working with a project called Dream, which came out of Columbia and IBM, to run computational challenges and contests. This is a way to bring non-traditional players into the data analysis process. It also is a way to, again, if you think about the research method, if you're stuck on a hypothesis generation loop, or if you're stuck, stuck on a methods generation loop, Running a challenge or a contest is a very effective way to broaden your space without having to hire on FTEs. Uh, we've gone from one a year to 12 to 15 a year. We have a big one open on digital mammography right now. It's got over a million dollars in prize money available. What we do is take the best projects at the end, though, and combine all of their features into consensus tools and methods, because those almost always outperform every submitter by an order of magnitude in terms of efficacy. And then we open source that as essentially algorithms and pseudocode that anyone can take and re-implement in their local environment. But all of this was not getting us to the point where we were creating open data or beginning to 
engage individuals at a larger level. So several years ago, we got into mobile clinical research through a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, as well as some research from the, uh, the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, which is part of HHS. Um, and we, we started with Parkinson's, which is where I'm going to spend most of my time talking about. We have four studies open at the moment. We host another seven at SAGE. Um, and in all of these, the concept was that uh, people are walking around with a really powerful research device in their pockets. Uh, they just happen to think it's a phone. And this tool is valuable as a direct sensor, which I'll talk about. It's also valuable simply as a communication, engagement, and authorization vector, uh, which I'll also talk about a little bit. Um, and this is where the bulk of the talk is going to be, is, is in this mobile context. So the, the, the hypothesis that we started with was that um, you can both be innovative and protect privacy and patient autonomy and participant autonomy. Um, this was sort of a controversial concept a couple of years ago. Uh, when we started working on informed consent and mobile studies, what we got told was you can only get there if you adopt the tech approach. You can only get there if you basically get people to sign away everything. You'll never be able to get informed consent on a phone. You'll never be able to get people to participate in the study ethically, so just forget it. Why bother? Right? Just go disrupt it. Right? Move fast and break things. Um, we, dis we fundamentally disagreed with that. Um, and we were lucky that we were able to start with some people uh, like Ray Dorsey from the University of Rochester in the Parkinson's community who were looking at their day-to-day -day clinical practice for Parkinson's and seeing where it was falling short and where they could actually translate that. So we didn't have to develop uh, a lot of the scientific rationale for this. We had really good partners. And they themselves really wanted to bake in privacy um, and autonomy into the process. So, it helped that we didn't have to convince our science and, and, and clinical partners to do this. That's sort of the first lesson, is work with people who agree with you. Uh, because if you have to convince someone that privacy is important, you'll probably never get to the science. But one of the first things that we talked about with Ray and, and the folks at Rochester was, what's the biggest ongoing longitudinal observational study you've got of Parkinson's symptom variation? And the number was about 1,800. And so for visual perspective, this is a church in Detroit that seats 2,000 people. So the entire study could fit into the church with 200 people, 200 pew seats left over. Let's go back to Google, right? Nevada versus Utah. So the sample size alone is, is laughable uh, from a Silicon Valley or a tech perspective. You could never get an app funded that had a universe of 1,800 users. And then let's get into the actual data collection. And again, this is not to sort of beat up on the study. This is standard of care, right? Uh, so one in-person <coughs> meeting uh, per year and uh, biannual follow-ups by phone and mail surveys. So we've got three data collection points per individual and an 1,800-person sample size, and only one of those data collection points involves any kind of in-depth clinical-grade data. And when we started doing the ethnography and the interviews, the doctors all said, yeah, the patients do their best on the day they come to clinic, right? They, they, they spend hours getting ready to come in and walk as well as they can or to do their dyskinesia tapping test as well as they can because they want to please the doctor. So they even think that the sample they're getting on the day that they come to clinic is biased by the desire of the participant to do as well as they can because if we score them on a four on the walk test, they feel better versus if they score a two on the walk test. Now, the phone is remarkably well fitted to this indication. So the, the dyskinesia test, you would tap on the table and the clinician would look at that and assign a qualitative scaled rating. If they're very advanced, they might videotape it and go back and count the actual taps. Um, and we can obviously do this on a, on a touch screen for 20 seconds. But what's interesting is that you get all this other dimensionality when you use a touch screen that's invisible in a traditional clinical context. So you don't just get the number of taps, you get the location of the taps, Right, the mean, the median, the max, all of this good stuff. And it begins to let you see that the same medicine has different impacts in different people in the lived experience of Parkinson's disease. So on the left, and this is, you can't read this, I apologize, I can send it on the paper. Um, we have an individual who's a 60-year-old man. The number of taps is the number one dimension that the analysis pulls out. So this is someone that we would have seen in a traditional context because the traditional measure would have worked. On the right, we have a woman and what we see is that for her, it's actually the, deep, the way that her fingers moved around. So net number of taps doesn't change significantly, but the location of the tapping before and after L-DOPA changes significantly. 
And so the concept was for any given test, let's think about can we take it onto the phone, can we design a, a sort of a biased, structured way to activate the sensor, because we don't want to just randomly sense the touch screen. Uh, we want to actually have it be a test and see how you do it. Um, can we design these tests in such a way that you can take them in the morning before meds and in the afternoon after meds on a daily basis so that we can see is the medicine working and how is it working on a day-to-day -day basis? And so just with tapping, and so I'm not sure how well you can see the colors, um, so this is one individual over the course of days from left to right, from day one moving on forward to the right. Um, the bottom of the graph line is before meds, the top of the graph line is after meds. If it's an up arrow, the number of taps went up. If it's a down arrow, the number of taps went down. And what you see is that for the first 30 days or so, this person got a relatively consistent benefit from the drug. Because most of the time, they're relatively long lines pointing up. Now in the middle, something happened. And what you see is that the drug stopped working in the, if it was working or it started working differently. And we got a change in the tapping. Uh, we get a lot more blue arrows. The, the red arrows are not as long. There are occasionally days where they're really long, which doesn't make much sense at all. But it's, it's, it's mixed. And then towards the right, we start to get back to a steady benefit again. And this begins to beg the question of what happened? Right? What happened? Can we actually buzz people with a question that says, did something change in your day-to-day -day life that affected it? And so tapping is one of the tests that we do. We also do phonations. We have people say, ah, to the microphone before and after meds. We have to put the phone in their pocket, take 20 steps forward, 20 steps back, measure gait, balance. We have them hold the phone, which lets us get tremor by measuring the uh, gyroscope and the accelerometer. Um, and we have to do a, a, a short memory test as well, just on the touch screen. And taken together, when you put all of these pieces together, you can begin to get an interesting multidimensional picture of what it's like to live with Parkinson's. Interestingly, just from a science perspective, each of these tests in the lab, like so it's just like the microphone and, and you're in the lab room and the brown fox jumped over the lazy dog, you can actually diagnose Parkinson's at a 90% accuracy versus non-Parkinson's. When you take it to the phone, into the real world, using ah, because that's much less identifiable under HIPAA, you actually get back down into the 60%, which is not that much better than random. But when you combine each of these tests together, Right? The five tests together gives you accuracy that goes back up into the high 90s again. Because it's really hard to fake the sensors day after day after day, over and over and over again, across all the different dimensions of the data. Um, and so, so it's interesting that the collective power of this is really quite high. But we were really interested in this piece in the middle here. right? Because you would frequently see these variations across the sensor tasks. So when someone started doing badly on one, they would start doing badly on all of them. Or maybe not badly. Whenever you saw a change in efficacy, that change was almost always covariant across all the various sensor tasks. So part of what we do is ask people, what do you think made you feel better? And what do you think made you feel worse? This is some sort of thing that gets you 35,000 comments in six months. And what's interesting are what stresses people out, right? So it's not surprising, things like exercise, walking, sleep, work, make people feel better. Things like pain, lack of sleep, and mood make people feel worse. So this is not particularly surprising, but what we started to find was the impact of life on people. So there's one group in our study that's affected by the news. They're particularly affected by race relations in the news. So when you see words like Ferguson, or Baltimore, or race, or Fox, or CNN, NBC, so other words have come up lately. Right? When people report these words, you see their sensor data change dramatically. And so what we're starting to see is the beginning of a way to think about, well, what would an intervention look like? Now, we're not an FDA-regulated medical device, so we cannot text you and say, um, you are reporting that the news stresses you out, and indeed your sensor data bears this out. Maybe you should stop watching the news. That would make us a regulated medical device. Um, but this is where the concept of data return gets interesting because we can return data to people without violating the FDA safe harbor. I'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, the other piece of this is if you're going to do this ethically, having really good taste in what you don't collect is very important. And this is again something that's opposite to tech land, right? So in tech land, tech knows that I go to Seattle all the time because that's where headquarters is. Google also knows I go to Knoxville a lot. That's where my parents live. My dad's been really sick for the last couple of years, so I spend a lot of time at home helping take care of him. Google knows enough where I am that when I land in Seattle, I get text messages with coupons for pizza 
at my regular pizza place in Seattle. Same thing when I get to Knoxville, but it's barbecue. Right? We don't need latitude and longitude. Right? We're using GPS in this study to get a sense of mobility and as a secondary indicator of depression. We don't need to know your GPS coordinates. We need to know how far you went over the course of a day, how many different places you went. So instead of taking GPS, we have a vector on the phone, so I have a pen on the phone, pen's encrypted, it never leaves the phone with your coordinates, and all we get are vectors that say how far you traveled over the course of the day. Right? And so constantly practicing good taste and collecting only the data you need to get the indication is a really important piece of this, because if we're going to share the data back with the individual or with other researchers, we have an obligation to make sure that data is as difficult to use for harm as possible. So uh, this was the science part of the study, and they threw this at the governance group, sort of like, okay, figure out how to consent 20,000 people just using phones, right? We're gonna keep going over here and working on tech. Um, and we started with this precept as the very first thing, which is that consent is an opportunity and it's not a burden. Um, and maybe this is because we came from outside of bioethics and we came from outside clinical practice, because as soon as we started interviewing people, they all told us that consent was a burden and that it was miserable. Um, and if, if this was our task, right, thanks to the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, we really started from this concept that it has to be a design priority, right? It's not an exercise or a checkbox. It's the first thing someone sees when they install the app, right? It's the front door of the study. And so it has to be designed as well as the rest of the study or people won't come in the front door. Um, so we spent six months doing ethnography, uh, doing research and interviews around informed consent. We talked to clinicians patients, patient advocates, lawyers, regulatory experts, software designers, um, people who loved consent, people who hated it. And what was really consistent was that everyone thought that no one understood informed consent, right? comprehension was lousy. Uh, the language in the consent documents was terrible to both sides, the clinician having to explain it and the person enrolling. Nobody had enough time to read the document and the format of the document itself was a structural barrier to informing this for most people. When we talked to the IRB folks and the regulatory folks, they said, yeah, we do our best, but these documents aren't about the study. They have to protect the institution against liability. They have to meet all these regulatory constraints. It's not our fault that the language is bad, the format is bad, and no one can understand it. So what was interesting, though, was everyone despairing about the process of informed consent. But when you actually got them into the interview, they would talk about how much they loved informed consent as a concept, how important it was, how sacred it was and how their despair came from the gap between the idea of informed consent and the practice of informed consent. In design, that's where you want to be. That's exactly where you want to be because that's where you can create something better because people want something better, they're dissatisfied. Um, so that frustration was really a powerful tool for the good. And at the end of the, of the research, we came up with this concept that a lot of the people involved in informed consent are, are dealing with what we call technical debt in software. So technical debt is when your platform has features that would cost too much to fix, so you want to live with them as pathologies. And in many ways, that's what we heard from IRBs. Like, we have these documents that are provided by council, we can't change them. That's a form of technical debt. Or we've always done it this way is a form of technical debt. We have clinicians who are comfortable with the existing process. You know, Johns Hopkins is not going to accept a form from the state of Pennsylvania that has the state of jurisdiction for lawsuits being in Pennsylvania. They're going to need it to be in Maryland. So that was the hard part, was that no one was going to change their local practice, their local forms, their local systems, right, their local boilerplate. Um, but the, these signs of support, right, this love of informed consent as a concept was the opening. And now in, in software, there's a very cheap hack, which is when you're stuck, you go up a layer of abstraction. Um, and so we were, this came up in one of the interviews from one of the technologists is, you know, can't you just create a user interface? Because all these consent documents are doing the same thing. Semantically, they're all the same. It's just syntactically, they're different. So isn't that an opportunity to go up a layer of abstraction? And so we were very lucky. We were working with the Electronic Data Methods Forum, which is part of the AHRQ. They helped us run all of these interviews and these design workshops, which the Berman uh, folks were very nice to come down and be a part of. And so we developed this concept of, of, of an interface layer for informed consent. Um, so this, this means an implication of tiered information access in which the actual consent document is not the most important vector for informing. It's important from a documentation of consent perspective, from a legal perspective, but we do not expect anyone in the consent transaction 
to use that document as the core of what they do. The top tier instead is a pictorial tier, and I'll talk about what and why we did that. The text dominant tier is still not the consent document, but a simple plain language summary of the key concepts in the pictorial layer. And then because you're gonna be on the phone, we're eliminating the only thing people liked, which was the fact that we could look each other in the eye and I could see if you understood it or not. So to replace that, we have a short assessment that we require a perfect score on. Um, this is something that we're gonna probably change away from a summative assessment to a formative assessment later time. But this is where we started because we wanted to be conservative. We didn't want to let people swipe right uh, all the way into a clinical study. Um, from the very beginning, we didn't want to establish that as a precedent. So in addition to the ethnography and the, and the traditional issues, there's two other problems on the phone. Um, the first is that quantitatively, people read about one out of three words on a screen. So if you do this through eye gaze fixation, people's eyes skip across as they scan in a way they don't scan in paper. Second, if you actually study the amount of time it takes them to read, and you assume they read at a normal human reading speed, uh, people are only reading one out of three words on a screen compared to paper. Interestingly, they think they've read all of them. This has implications way outside of bioethics. All right, as we move to reading content on screens, and it's not a phone thing, it's a screen thing. No one really understands why. The second is culturally, we've gotten used to clicking OK on, screen, on interstitial dialogue boxes that are between us and things we want. So this is, this is a, you know, a humorous example. This has actually been replicated in an actual social study. Uh, people clicking OK on Wi-Fi, free Wi-Fi terms of use that include a Heron clause in which you agree to give up your firstborn child for the free Wi-Fi. <laughs> this was an art project in London, but it's actually been replicated. It's one of the few studies that I've seen that's been replicated. And so you, you additionally have this extra burden on a phone, which is we know you're not reading. And we know if you want to go forward, you'll click OK. Both of those cut against autonomy in the informativeness context. So we have these extra burdens. So the initial metaphor was, let's think about the most important concepts that need to be communicated to a potential participant. And let's treat those as top level screens that have a visual uh, design. And so the, if you go to the empirical foundation of BuzzFeed and online news, what you find is that the combination of an on-task picture, a headline and a sub-headline, slows down eye gaze tracking, slows down reading speed to speeds that approach print. And this is why you get a picture, a headline, and you won't believe what happens next everywhere on the internet. Because that is shown to slow down your gaze and fix your eyes on a certain piece of the screen. So let's use that, and we'll say for any given study, there is not an infinite number of concepts that need to be conveyed. We can extract those, we can have a debate with the IRB, with the bioethicists, with the study designers, with participants to say what actually needs to be conveyed. And we render it in this picture, headline, subheadline format. Um, so this was, this was my crappy design. Right? So I'm not a designer, but this is what I did at PowerPoint to get started. This is what happened after the first professional designer got a hold of it. And this is what it looked like after Apple's designers helped us with it. Because around this point, Apple decided they wanted to get into mobile clinical studies. They found us and we were lucky enough to partner with them both on a technological and a governance level to, to help them launch research kit uh, about a, almost two years ago now. And so you see is we've got the iconic representation at the top. The key concept is activities. We have the sub headline which expresses that. And then you can navigate on that learn more link to a summary of the concept of activities that is longer than this because if you go over 25 to 30 words, you lose the entire eye gaze fixation benefit of the method. Um, the screen is structured very intentionally using traditional software design methods. At the navigation layer, you can only go back or get out. The only links you have available below that are to learn more and to move forward. And this is all structured in a very similar way. It should be intuitive to someone who's using a phone. And the navigation to the learn more screen reinforces the concept if you click on it. Sort of by definition, if you clicked on the learn more, you probably were unsure or wanted to know, so we only let you navigate back to the same screen. So we, get, we actually get a visual reinforcement of the icon, headline, subheadline layer. The icon choice is very important. So uh, for things like privacy, we, we could have chosen something very happy about privacy risk, because it's actually quite a low risk. Um, but we felt that this was the number one risk for someone to know when enrolling in the study. So we chose a very uh, culturally triggering metaphor of the red hand. Because we felt like this was literally the most important thing from a risk perspective someone should understand. 
rather than something that indicated how safe we were keeping the data. Because it really culturally affects people's willingness to enroll in this thing. So we figure risks ought to have scarier icons, um, not happier icons. Because if you do that, you're really putting your thumb on the scale from an informative perspective. And what you get then is essentially a narrative, a visual narrative of the study that would hopefully approach what an informed clinician would teach a participant over the course of explaining it. Um, in an ideal world, this also provides a narrative guide for the clinician, because we heard loud and clear from the clinicians that they didn't understand the damn forms either. And so the hope was that, you know, no matter what, this is not tied to mobile. Um, this is something you can use on a paper tear-off sheet that sits on top of a printed consent form, which creates a conversation support guide for the clinician and the patient in a traditional setting as well. And indeed, that's where we're heading with PMI, precision medicine. We expect for low literacy populations, for facilitated consent, low SES, low comfort with technology, this method will actually sit as a two-pager uh, fold on top that sits on top of a traditional printed consent document to make sure the study coordinator conveys the IRB approved risks and benefits to the participant in a clean, reproducible way. Because there's a lot of variation at that level as well. So um, when we talked about privacy, uh, we wanted to make sure that we weren't thinking of privacy only as eliminating the risk of identification. Privacy is an umbrella concept that contains all sorts of things that are not necessarily comfortable bedfellows. And so uh, part of this was also letting people make educated choices about the risks and the benefits with which they're comfortable. And part of that is data liquidity and data sharing, which I'll talk about uh, in just a second. Um, now, if we're going to do this, I mean, this is a pedagogical method. We didn't invent it. We, we sort of grunted it from elsewhere on the, on the internet. But what we felt was important was an assessment loop, since again, we're getting away from that face-to-face -face interaction. Can we assess whether or not you learned this effectively? And so working with the, the bioethicists and the IRB, we developed a short set of binary questions. These don't need to be complex questions. This is not a high-risk study. There's no intervention. It's observational. Um, even the data that might potentially be breached if we were attacked by a state actor uh, are not particularly identifiable or risky. We maintain them entirely separate databases, blah, blah, blah. And to be honest, we practice good enough security that unless we are really targeted, it's going to be hard to get access to this. But we still want to make sure people understand it because there is a small non-zero risk. So um, we actually used uh, questions inspired by that same observational study uh, that, we, that we launched from that 1800 person study. So they actually have a five question quiz. We adapted that quiz for our purposes and added a couple of questions uh, that were relevant to an electronic study versus an in-person study. Um, as a nonprofit, we give everything away, so all of this is available through the participant toolkit, uh, all the iconography, all the workflows. Um, so you see uh, uh, we have sort of a, a set of rules of thumb and heuristics for building. The iconography, we have hundreds and hundreds of icons that we've sourced from a variety of open source or public domain uh, elements that are all labeled semantically and searchable through file names. We have sample workflows so that you don't have to start from nothing. We encourage people who like this to work in PowerPoint, not to develop application code before you go to IRB. IRB members have PowerPoint on their desktops. They are able to add comments and edits in ways that are very efficient, and you have, don't have to pay a programmer to fix it when it's over. This is also part of the culture which says that you're not going to the IRB saying, it's done, let me upload it to the App Store. But this is the beginning of a conversation, and when we're done, we'll fix that in the medium of the application works way better than showing up and saying, we've solved the problem, now get out of our way, which again is the tech ethic. Right? Um, the design layouts, all of this is available. We make it available in both the formal fixed version of the Apple versions, as well as our early stages. In many ways, these early stage cartoons are actually better to work with because um, it's funny, when you present something with a very shiny, finished thing, they're much less likely to criticize it, even if they don't like it. Um, no one really knows why, but in many cases, we actually use Comic Sans as, as the font. Because as loathsome as it is, um, people are willing to critique the text in some Comic Sans in a way they aren't in Helvetica. And all of these go into whether or not you get the feedback that you want. Because if you go, if you go out and start recruiting with something people aren't comfortable with, the criticisms will come back. You have an obligation to find those criticisms early and to use every tool at your advantage to do that. 
But it's not just the, the design, it's the workflow. Uh, your average programmer doesn't know that the app shouldn't collect data the minute it's installed. Uh, the vast majority of apps, the minute they're on the phone, they start collecting data. So the idea that your app shouldn't collect data until after consent is not something that everyone knows about. This is, again, fractal when you work with tech developers. We were very close to, to launching um, our first apps, and they came back and they said, hey, we saw that you just had age. We changed it to birthday. So you can send messages saying, happy birthday. Like, yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> um, and so all through the app development process, you have to work with programmers who are used to collecting everything. Right, for lots of reasons, and sort of say, you know, no, that's not cool, right? The IRB approved us for age, not date of birth. And if you add date of birth with the year on it, we create major HIPAA problems. So please undo that fix. And so these, these workflows for the developers are actually really important bootstrapping tools. Something else that developers don't think about is you have to have a website, and the website has to have all the information that would be on your flyers. So we can make all of that available, all the way down to the stock photography, the components of the website, that they don't forget that you have to have eligibility or who's running the study or how to reach them. Um, because a lot of the people that are jumping into clinical study now through mobile have no idea of all of the other requirements, not just build some cool stuff and sense things. So that was the first weird thing that we did. Uh, the second weird thing that we did was say we believe that we should let participants be in charge of whether or not to share their data. Uh, this is frequently a funder mandate that is resisted by the clinician, or it's something that the clinician wants to do, it's resisted by the institution. Um, in, in most cases, it's one of those two angles. Um, to us, this sort of cuts against autonomy in a lot of ways. Um, so the idea was, let's ask people if they want to share their data. Um, in the people that have enrolled since March uh, in, in our studies, um, more than three in four choose to donate their data to science. Um, now, this is what it looks like. A after you've consented, you get this dialogue screen that says, only share my data with SAGE and its partners, right, according to the clinical protocol, or share it with qualified researchers worldwide. There is no default. So this is a blank choice. You do have to make a choice to move forward. Now, in order to do this, we felt like we had to give people some information about this choice as well. So uh, the screen on the left just shows you can download your data and take it with you. We think this is an important um, escape valve for, uh, for data to go along with the individual anywhere. But this concept of future independent research being valuable is one that we thought was worth communicating. So we tell people that their data is valuable in addition to the study. It could be used for other research if they want to. You get to make that choice. Right? With your permission, we'll share your coded data with qualified researchers. We qualify them under a set of rules, but we do not control the research that they do and uh, a little bit about what we share. Right? We don't share their name or their email address, we use it with a random code. Now, in order to become a qualified researcher, um, the design inspiration, this was actually uh, global entry to the United States. I, my wife's Brazilian, I spent a long time going back and forth and being out of the country. And it struck me one day going through customs that it was amazing that I could get in and out of the United States this way, but I couldn't get in and out of a database this way. So when you decompose global entry, you have to prove your identity, I scan, that's very invasive, right? Um, you have to uh, go through a background check, right, which is sort of like a test, and you have to sort of make a pledge that you're not going to violate, and if you violate, there'll be penalties. So we adapted this. We said, well, qualified researchers shouldn't be anonymous. Right? The participants should be anonymous. The researchers should be known, including to the participants. We actually make them pass a test. It's a 13-question test. We started with 17 on the ethics of using personal data in the cloud. Right? Um, and then they have to file a statement that says, what do they plan to do with the data? And then the last thing they have to do is very similar to our consent. We don't expect that anyone's going to read the terms of use. So we make them download, print, sign and initial, scan, upload, and post to their public, verified, identified profile this oath. Right? And it says, you know, I won't re-identify, I won't share the data, I won't use it for advertising. These are all very important to the, our participants. I'll keep it secure, I'll protect privacy, I'll publish open access, I'll credit participants. Right? And the same research that led us to the consent led us here, which is when you have to sign next to something, you're probably going to read it. This is why in real estate transactions, you have to put your initials on so many different places in the document. And all of these things together are supposed to create a set of transaction costs that minimize the most predictable misuses of the data. Bullying, trolling, doxing, use for marketing, right? resale. 
because now we have a chain of custody back to that individual. If they violate, we can name them. We can, we can send their names to the FDA, to the NIH. We've got nice uh, angles to do that already. Plus, like the whole annoying ass process of doing this filters out the vast majority of people who are going to be jerks about the data. And what's really nice is that we can actually feed back the participants' data uses. So we've got about, I think, 85 qualified users of the data. At this point, we launched this in March of this year. So we've got about eight months of work. It's on every continent except uh, Antarctica at this point. We have users in multiple languages. We have corporate users, academic users, government users, nonprofit users. And it's really, really interesting the way that this is developed. We haven't had a single breach or complaint that we're aware of yet. And so now that we're about eight months through this, we're beginning to take all of the other studies that we've done, because we just did this with Parkinson's data, and we're beginning to put them into the same queue of the same system. We're starting to explore how this framework will work for precision medicine as well. Um, if you're interested in any of this, uh, you can go to the various papers we published about this earlier this year. This is, this is the scientific data paper describing it. This is what the uh, public research portal looks like. You can go browse the data yourself, sample data, can browse the research statements, uh, and you can become a qualified researcher as well yourself if you want to get at the data yourself. So I wanted to end by um, talking about where we're going. It's this old thing in, in, in hockey, Wayne Gretzky said, I, I don't score because I, I go where the puck is, I score because I go where the puck is going. I'm not a hockey person, but I love the metaphor. Um, what we've done is only interesting because of the abject failure of informed consent the last 10 years. It's not because what we're doing is really good or is best. And so, although people like what we've done, we try to constantly remind ourselves that what we have done is basically take a very simple pedagogy that designers don't think is that interesting. Right? I show this to designers, they're like, that's so 2015. I'm like, yeah, I know, that's really, really hip in, in bioethics. Um, but this is good for teaching things that we think we know, right, epistemically. We think we understand what it means to study Parkinson's this way, and we think we know what it means to figure out if you have understood it or not. This breaks down entirely when we talk about things like your complete electronic health record, or your genome. Because those are areas where the actual risks and benefits are for the most part emergent, right? unknown, in many ways unknowable. The goal of the studies that we are doing now is to begin to understand those benefits and those risks, to quantify them, to understand. And when we were doing some of the ethnography on this, I had, I had a participant who said, you know, I don't know if coffee is good or bad for me this week. Because I keep reading in the news that a new study came out that said it was good, and a new study that came out that said it was bad. Is that what it's going to be like with my DNA? And he answered, yep. Absolutely. Because <laughs> we're going to come out and say, this gene is important. It'll turn out, this gene activates a process that leads to this protein that interacts with this external chemical and this lifestyle choice. And so yeah, this is what it's going to be like. Being in this study, getting this data, is going to be about uncertainty and about not knowing. So what are the things that we're thinking about? Um, known knowns, right? This is a, obviously a draft icon for trolling. Um, <laughs> right, but this is not, not a fake story here, right? We have doctors who are attacking patients because they left bad Yelp reviews and revealing their patient's identity and personal information. Right? As we move into a participant-centered world, this will be a risk. If someone gets mad about the study and gives it a nasty Yelp review or a nasty review on the App Store, what if one of the study coordinators retaliates on Yelp? Right? These are known knowns. Right? But then there's all this other weird stuff, like do we have to teach people what extraction of the data from databases means? Do we have to teach them about encryption at rest or during transfer? Or the difference between anonymized, de-identified, and pseudonymized? Right? Where it's going? Like, where do we, how much do we need to teach? Um, what do we need to talk about in terms of risks, right? The limits of this. There's a lot of press around reidentification, things like Netflix or AOL, that ignores the, the actual frequency of those reidentifications. So in Netflix, you have you know, two people out of 500,000 got reidentified, but if you read the press about it, it sounds like everyone got reidentified. This is pretty common. So there's an asymmetric risk perception of reidentification. Um, then you know, the risk of sharing or, or discovery of certain things is very personal, right? So you know, I'm not a particularly worried guy about my stuff, but even I wouldn't be super happy if my therapist records from 10 years ago made it onto my public health profile. 
right? And then, again, what about autonomy of my family members, right? I have, I have two sisters, both of them have chronic illness. Um, my sharing of my DNA affects them, affects their kids, right? We're, we're sort of blundering into this world, we don't know what it means. Um, benefits for things like EMR, right? It would be great, right? People like to talk about the benefits of EMR sharing. Uh, you've got your complete EMR on your phone because you're in this study that means you can go to your doctor and you don't have to fill out all of the survey forms, you can just upload your EMR. What about the downsides of that? What if that means that the errors in my EMR propagate to my new doctor and they keep giving me the wrong medicine? And then there's all of these issues around our rights. So we have 33 different state regulations around genetics, national laws, right, and these issues around you know, where does the data live and where does it get accessed. And so we're not sticking with what I showed you for that. So I'm going to show you very, very exploratory concepts. Please don't laugh. Um, so these are the sort of things you get when you do ethnography and, and interaction design. You start with like Pinterest boards. And so I'm going to show them the four Pinterest pieces that, that we're using as our jumping off point for 2017. And these go up in terms of the interaction required out of the participant. So the first one that came out of our interviews was the, the, the Harry Potter sorting hat. So the idea would be that you're, you would have some sort of magic technology system that looks at an individual's data and sorts them just to see how risky they are from a perspective. Right? So we could bend them into likely risk and likely perceptions of risk and feed them a consent process that's appropriate. This is my least favorite, it's the most technocratic, uh, but you, know, you always have to put something on the table that has a low burden for the participant. And this is it, this is the lowest burden because the system decides. It creates all sorts of questions like what are the bins, right? Remember the bins I talked about for me? Cooking, camping, hiking. The bins we choose affect the structures that we have. And so this is really important. Plus, how transparent would the machine need to be to be fair? It's like a challenge the way that it sort of be, right? I don't want to be a Hufflepuff, right? I want to be in the, the other house. The ballot box. This is an interesting one. So we say, let's come up with statements about genetics, for example or about EHRs, um, that are provocative statements. And then I can sort them on the phone to the left or right of the middle, and to the left indicates that this state makes me more comfortable, to the right it makes me less comfortable. This is actually really easy algorithmically to take a plot of those points and have a statement that says, you are really comfortable with risk, you are really not comfortable with risk, and say, you know, you appear to be really uncomfortable with a lot of the core tenets of this study. Are you sure you want to go forward? Because this is a way to activate the lizard brain, right, the emotional brain, because what we show them might make them cognitively want to get into the study. We have to begin to trigger and access their emotional brain and give them a checkpoint. We don't want to tell them they can't go. That violates autonomy. But we want to provoke them and make sure they're making a choice that's informed as possible. Colossal Kate Adventure, I'm in my mid-40s, so I played this as my first computer game as a kid. Right? Um, you are in a long, narrow corridor stretching out of sight to the west, and the eastern end is a hole through which you can see a profusion of leaves. Right? We can adopt this and say, it's a choose-your-adventure game about genetics or EHR sharing that you have to win in order to be informed, to, to qualify to go. Right? This has all sorts of hair from a design perspective, from an autonomy perspective, but it's a fairly good way, if you think you've got a high-risk study, to make sure that someone really gets it and really wants it to go forward. This is the one that interests me the most. I'm not a Trekkie, but again, we had, a, we had a couple of people in our interviews that were really creative. But it was, you know, it's in the Star Trek universe, the Kobayashi Maru is a test. So Kirk hacks it and wins. I know, I've been told by Trekkies every time I give this talk. What's interesting to me is the concept is you provide a test that can't be won. And so for this, the concept would be, and in the Star Trek universe, it's a, it's a battle that no matter what you do, everyone dies. Everyone. And so the idea that came out of the interviews was, could we put the participant in the shoes of the investigator, where they had to make choices about a clinical outcome, or a research question, or a data sharing decision, that had no completely beneficial outcomes. And whatever choice they came up with, give them a set of like five or six things that they could do, and whatever they do, we show them the externalities of that choice, and let them go back and do it as many times as they want. And then at the end say, these are the kinds of choices that the people who have, are going to have your data have to make. Do you still want to go in or not? Because you know, what we started with is the lowest level, right? It is simply providing an interface to a broken interaction in the real world. The opportunity is, right now, because of the success of this, because of the 
adoption by Apple, by precision medicine, et cetera, we have an opportunity to really get into the interaction and say, what does it mean to be informed? What does it mean to understand and, and sign up for research? And how can we take these concepts, break them apart, and distribute them so that it's not just us doing them, it's people who disagree with us, people who want to be on Android, people who don't speak English, people who want to take these concepts and make them their own. Because this is the real opportunity, and it's something that I think has a social application beyond just bioethics, because we have basically lost the concept that people should understand things. We've created these echo chambers. And you know, my hope is that this isn't just a way to do work in bioethics and clinical research, but this begins to demonstrate that it's actually not impossible to engage people in an ethical way through technology. Um, with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity.
missions to look at. Uh, that's going to be better for participants than just what we're giving them so far, I think. Um, we haven't used it effectively yet. We're still trying to figure out, like, at what point are we crossing the line into encouraging behavior? And if we give you a graph that says, here's all of your big change moments and all of the things you said that caused them, you know, uh, we've been wary of not sort of activating the FDA around that. Um, what I think is more important is the principle of export. So I think the big value will not be downloading it for yourself, but downloading it and sending it automatically to a third party. Um, my hope is that whether it's you know, disease foundations, advocacy groups, nonprofits, for profits, um, start focusing on providing designs that people can put their health data into, uh, and then they can use that as a way to make better choices about their health over time. I think the real value will be setting this as a precedent for that, um, especially as things like genomics and EHR start to merge into your data profile, because then that value becomes not my accelerometer data, but I've, I've got the ability to take my data to someone who gives me the interpretation that I'm looking for. Um, that's not there yet, which is why I think it's, this is more about sort of saying, in the very earliest studies, these principles are, are, are important. Are there any kind of data standards, though, to allow that kind of interoperability? Of <coughs> Depends on who you talk to. There's a lot of people who work on data standards who would say yes. There's a lot of people who work on data who would say no. But I think, you know, OMA uh, at the EHR level is very really promising. We have to be done, unfortunately. But thank you, John. It was really wonderful.